My name is Sue Palmer. It is August 19th, 2011. We are in Nashville for the interview of Judge Gilbert S. Merritt for the Legal History Project of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Tell us your full name and where you were born and when you were born. Um, if I remember correctly, it's Gilbert Stroud Merritt, Jr. I was born in Nashville, Tennessee in St. Thomas Hospital, January 17, 1936, and there was a huge snow of about a foot deep. A foot deep in Nashville? Yeah, according to my <laughs> mother. <laughs> um, how do we know each other, Judge Merritt? Well, we know each other because some 20 years ago you were a law clerk for me, and you were a great law clerk. You were there for two years, and um, so that's the first I knew of you. I've forgotten who, one, one of the faculty members called and said you need to hire Sue Palmer. She's the founder's mailist, first in her class and you need a little more intelligence in your chambers. <laughs> <laughs> How do you choose uh, law clerks, Judge Merritt? Well, being first in the class is not a disadvantage. Um, also, we had an interview and we talked, and a lot of it is how do you think you would get along? How comfortable will you be together in the chambers? Because there's a lot of interchange between a judge and the law clerks in the chambers, and. There needs to be a, an informality and a, um, the, people need to like each other, too, as well as respect each other. So let's talk about your uh, family. Uh, tell us something about your grandparents. Well, my uh, grandparents on my father's side, uh, my grandfather uh, was a uh, pretty temperamental fellow. He had been an executive with the old Cumberland Telephone Company. He got mad at the president and quit because he was land poor. He had a lot of land and decided he would be a farmer. And a, so he was in the dairy business. My father was raised in the dairy business. My grandmother was a, a woman who memorized the Bible as a fundamentalist Christian who believed that she would live to see the second coming. And she lived to be 103, but she missed. She's missed out on the second coming. And my, on the other side, my grandfather, my mother's um, mother and father. My grandmother was a very interesting woman, who from the time my mother was born was deaf and had diabetes, but was Port Laureate of Tennessee for some number of years, and her husband was a businessman who started um, Southern Woodenware Company back about 1900. Uh, and he and Cordell Hull, before Cordell Hull got into politics, were fellow drummers, to, salesmen together, catching the train into Alabama. So that's kind of the family grandparents. So tell us the name of the Poet, poet Laureate. Nora Johnson Cantrell. Uh, and, well, tell us the names of, of the rest as well, not just the boy. Dempsey Weaver Cantrell was her husband, and um, my grandmother's name on my father's side was Maud Merritt. Um, what was her maiden name? <laughs> Logue, Maud Logue Merritt. And uh, my grandfather on my father's side was Stokely Donaldson Merritt. Uh-huh. So you're related to the Donaldson somewhere. Yeah, my grandfather seven times removed was John Donaldson who came down the river, uh, actually, yeah, came down the Tennessee and then up the Cumberland to start Nashville in 1779, 1780. Um, so, and so tell us now about your parents. My father, uh, my father was the hardest working fellow I've ever met. He was determined during the Depression that he was going to get out of the dairy business, although he had uh, grown up in the dairy business. So he talked to his father, and his father didn't have enough money to send him to Vanderbilt. 
So he talked his father into giving him uh, some land, and he, he with some uh, people who worked, um, built a barn and worked his way through Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt Law School. But when he got out, the Depression was still going on, and he decided that he would go into business uh, there at Southern Woodware Company. My grandfather on my mother's side wanted to, wanted him to come in there. And so he um, ran that business until 1955 when he died in an airplane crash. He was only 44. And my mother um, then uh, was single for many years and she remarried and she was a great help to me. My mother, Angie Fields Cantrell Merritt, was a um, housewife and um, had a lot of civic interests. And when my first wife died in 1973, my mother was a great help to me in raising our three children who were at that time six, seven, and eight, I believe. So I had a very close relationship with my mother. Uh, they were, I was the only child, so I got all the attention, you know, <laughs> I guess. And I have all the, the downsides of that, and there are some upsides to it. <laughs> and, and what was your wife's name? Louise Fort Merritt. And uh, you then became a single parent. Yes. And uh, how did that change your life and what kinds of things did your mother do for you? Well, in uh, 1973 I became a single parent. I went on the Court of Appeals on the bench 1977. Uh, so uh, in, in doing that I had to go to Cincinnati for periods of time. So my mother uh, was a great help to me in raising my children, although raising my children was primarily, um, of course, my responsibility uh, after that. But um, it was, you know, in many ways, um, it's a terrible thing because my wife Louise, who was subject to bipolar depression, committed suicide, and uh, that is a very difficult thing to deal with and difficult not only for the husband and members of her family, but for her children. But my children have turned out fine. And I give, uh, Louise was a very good mother before she got this depression that caused her to commit suicide. And she was a very good mother and the children were in a stable situation before that time. And then my mother was a very good grandmother and very helpful. And so we made the best out of a bad situation. Well, I want to come back uh, to uh, the names of your children, but I want to tell a little, I want to learn a little bit more about your childhood. Uh, as you were growing up, you said you were an only child uh, with some, maybe a little bit spoiled, but uh, some, some uh, benefits of being an only child. What are the benefits of being an only child? Well, there was a pretty high degree of discipline. You're the only one they have to discipline. Mm -hmm. So you get a substantial amount of that, and uh, but uh, they were fair, <laughs> certainly. I grew up on a farm uh, basically most of the time. Uh, my father bought a, another farm uh, which was next door to the Hermitage, and I grew up on that farm. And he, he although he ran a business, he had a huge dairy business there. He always felt after the depression that businesses in the end go broke and are subject to a lot of risk and he always felt like he could uh, f uh, feed his family when push comes to shove and he knew the dairy business up one side and down the other having grown up into it and he grew up in it when there was actually you milked the cows without milking machines so I grew but when, by the, a little bit early uh, we were still milking without milking machines, but most of my young life we had milking machines and my job was to go over there and strip the cows out after the milking machines had milked them. Uh, so I grew up on a farm helping get up hay and baling hay and doing that kind of thing. 
And also, I would, when I got a little older, would go down to my father's business with him, and uh, he wanted me to learn something about it. It was a pretty good sized business, but he, you know, it was always up in the air whether I was going to go into that business or do something else. Uh, so, did <clears throat> back to the cows? Did you actually learn to milk a cow without the milking machine? Oh yeah. Fact is, when I before the milking machines came in. When I used to go down to the barn, um, the, the uh, milkers uh, would turn the cow's tit up if it were full and squeeze on it and shoot the milk all the way across the room <laughs> into my mouth. <laughs> so when I was about, nah, the milking machines came in, I would guess when I was about five or six. So yeah, I learned, but I, my hands were not very strong. My father was not as large as I was when I was 18 or 19, but he could take, he had grown up milking and he still could take my hand and crush it <laughs> because his hands were so strong from all those years. Uh, so uh, you lived on the farm, was, what was your relation to the city of Nashville? Did you come into the city of Nashville? Every, back then in the 40s and 50s, uh, the, everything was in the city of Nashville, all the movies, well, there one or two exceptions, but basically all the movies, all the shops, uh, if you wanted to really to go to a men's store or to buy something or whatever, department store, everything was downtown. There, there were no shopping centers. Uh, the first shopping center was out in Madison, second in Green Hills, but there were, there were no shopping centers, so shopping was all downtown. So yes, we, we went to church in downtown Nashville, the First Presbyterian Church. Uh, so yeah, I was in town a lot. It was 12 miles from the Hermitage area, the, and that was all rural at that time. There were no subdivisions, no nothing out there except farms. And did you, uh, did you had, a, a, your family had a car? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, my father was, he, he did very well in this business, although he was, uh, had a hard time growing up because of the depression. He did very well in the business, so he was uh, pretty prosperous. Um, so tell us about your uh, early uh, school life. Started Donaldson, grade school? Donaldson Grammar School, where my mother had gone to school. We had some of the same teachers. My mother, and, and you know, back at that time, you were a teacher at one point in the past. Back at that time, the public schools were oftentimes very good because women didn't have a chance to do much other than become teachers. And there were some great teachers. I went six years to the Donaldson Grammar School where it was very good. And then my parents decided that I should go to Castle Heights Military Academy, which was about 12 miles the other direction from Nashville toward Lebanon. And so I went I started in the seventh grade and finished uh, Castle Heights, uh, however many years later that is, six years later. Uh, so that's where I went to high school as a child growing up. Did you board at the high school or was it just travel no, every day? No, I, I didn't board. I went after I got to be 14, you could get a license. And so I went to school, out of, my dad got me a a little car, Chevrolet, and I uh, commuted to school. Um, what did you learn from being in a military school? I learned that I didn't want to make a career out of the military, uh, among other things. Um, I learned, you know, we had lots of military science and tactics sort of instruction, and it was mainly oriented, it was just a, after the Second World War, so it was oriented in that direction. I found much of the military to be inconsistent with my temperament in that I don't like uh, a lot of unnecessary polishing of belts and shoes and so on, and that was a big part of the military. Now, I was a day student, so I didn't get the full brunt of it. But um, 
there are certain very admirable things, and certainly in wartime, the sacrifice uh, and the altruism of uh, troops uh, is a major benefit to the country. But it seems to me in this country today, we've overdone the warrior mentality, so to speak. And I learned early on that I did not, absent wartime and a real need, become a war, didn't want to become a warrior. Um, so after, d during your school years, what did you do during the summertime? I worked on the farm or worked down at my father's um, wholesale business. Now, was your father's wholesale business downtown? Second Avenue. Mm -hmm. You know, Nashville got its start in many ways as a wholesale center because of the river and then the railroad. So the, after the Civil War, all the South was poor, Nashville a little better because it was occupied, but Nashville became a wholesale center for much of the southeastern part of the United States. So you finished high school. Uh, when did you begin thinking about college? What colleges did you think of? And uh, where did you go to college? Went to Yale and I didn't, I thought I'd go to Vanderbilt. My father, as I said, had gone to Vanderbilt. But the headmaster of the school, I was a good student in school academically. And you know, back then the idea was you need to be well-rounded. You need to be a good student. You needed to play sports and do this and do that. Today, I think, it's more you need to become very good at one thing, you know, outstanding at one thing. But then it was well-roundedness was the, at least in, in my family. Uh, so the headmaster asked me, uh, I guess sometime in my junior year, and he was my English teacher too, where I was going to go to college. And I said, I don't know, maybe Vanderbilt. I hadn't really thought about it too much. And he said, then he suggested Yale and Harvard and so on. And so I said, well, uh, maybe I'll think about that. And I mentioned it to my father and he said, that's a good idea. So we went up and looked at several schools, including Yale. My father liked Amherst for some reason too. And so I applied and uh, I got in, but I got in one or two others first because they didn't have their admissions coordinated back at that time. and You'd have to know my father, but he, I had to send in some money to one of them in order to hold my place and hadn't heard anything from Yale, so he called the director of admissions of Yale on the phone. I would have been very embarrassed, but anyway, uh, Mr. Noyes was his name, I remember, and he said, my boys, and I, you know, we've got to send in this money and just curious as to when you're going to give us an idea. And Mr. Noyes said to his secretary, Miss So-and-so, bring me Merritt's file. So I brought it in and he said to my father, if your boy wants to go to Yale, I suggest that he not send his money in to some other school. But of course, I can't tell you what the outcome is going to be <laughs> <laughs> until, until it comes out. So uh, that's kind of what happened. So he didn't send the money? No, he didn't send the money. <laughs> Um, so, did you know anyone else who was going to Yale? Not when I got there. See, did I? Uh, no, I didn't, no. I don't think so. Uh, and I was uh, off the farm. I, I understand. And, and Yale at that time was pretty provincial in that it was uh, Eastern Seaboard, New England. Um, it was beginning to broaden out. I probably, well, I was, a, as I said, I was a good student in, in high school. so. Uh, I don't know that I could get in today, but um, they were beginning to broaden out and try to get more uh, diversity in the sense of more geographical diversity. And uh, so there were a few people coming from California. There were a lot of people from Chicago, too. But no, I really didn't know anybody. And uh, based on what you remember, were there other people from the Southeast in your class? Some. But in my class, there were 1,200 students, more or less. 60 of them were from Andover, 50 from Exeter, <laughs> X number from Lawrenceville, X number from Deerfield, Choate, et cetera. 
And um, so, it, as I say, it was somewhat provincial, really. And uh, what did you study there? Major in English. I really tried to get a, is, it was like opening an horizon, seeing a new horizon, because it was so different from the South in many ways. And of course, the faculty at Yale in the English department, still I understand it's true, but then it was by far the best English department in the world. They had Robert Penn Warren, Cleanth Brooks, and many other people who were really outstanding scholars and writers. And so I majored in English, um, but I did. A lot, I read. I, I took history, philosophy. I hardly knew what philosophy was until I took the course, and uh, some science. But I, now I look back on it, regretting that I didn't do more in math and science. But there was not a lot of emphasis back then. It was more an emphasis on the humanities, and uh, nowadays it's somewhat more of an emphasis on science and math and so on, which I think is uh, good because, but anyway, I majored in English. And it was a great, I, I was really interested in it. Now tell me, uh, you can never say, of course, what would have happened at, at, in a road not taken, but what, do you, what difference do you think it made in your life that you went to New England to go to school rather than staying in, in the South? Well, I just think uh, it's like any kind of travel or any kind of s seeing things that you've never seen before and things that make you perhaps a little uncomfortable and create a little self-doubt that you have to overcome uh, and, and to find if you work hard enough uh, that you can uh, do okay uh, and that gives you some confidence, I think. If because you know the at least the, what Yale and Harvard preached then and still preach to some extent is this is the cream of the crop, you know, I doubt that that is entirely true, but uh, doing well there gives you a sense of confidence. I would say that was helpful. And then I just don't think I would have come in contact with at that time uh, at Vanderbilt the quality of the faculty that existed there. Now, the quality of the faculty at Vanderbilt has very much improved over that time, but when I went to Yale, I also applied to Vanderbilt, and if you could read and write and had a degree, you didn't have to take any tests, and particularly if you had a pretty good record. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know that they turned anybody down. The reason is I've always been the beneficiary of the Depression uh, cohort so that there are very few babies born during the Depression compared to before, and certainly after the baby boom. And, you know, the economy has always, up until recently, been expanding, so there have been jobs available. The people born in 1935, 1936, 37 have had the advantage of small. a small cohort. And so it, that has to be, that's not something that people think about much, but it's certainly, I'm very aware of it. Uh, so, and so you, your generation just had fewer people and... Uh, when I got out of law school, there were jobs everywhere for mm -hmm. lawyers. Mm -hmm. Now they get out of law school, unless you're high in the class, it's difficult to get a job. Now that's of the la uh, recent vintage, last couple of years. So now what year did you go to Yale? I graduated in 57. You graduated from Yale Yale in 57, um, and then you, I want to talk more about your choice of law school, but you went to law school uh, in, in uh, the, that following fall. Yes. And what made you decide that you wanted to go to Vanderbilt to go to law school, or what made you decide to go to law school at all? Well, I started at Harvard and transferred to Vanderbilt in the first semester. That was not too long after my father died in the business, anyway. I was unhappy at Harvard Law School in the f first two months. I didn't like it. Um, and, uh, but I was uh, having to decide, you know, before I really had the sense to decide what direction I wanted my life to take after college. And I was thinking about getting a PhD in English or history. I also liked philosophy. And I was also thinking about my father's business. Now, he had 
just died, whether this is something that I wanted to do. And it seemed to me that law, back at that time, law was much more of a calling than it is now. The legal profession was so much smaller, 10% of what it is now. And lawyers were not particularly specialized. So you did everything across the board. And it was not entirely like being going to divinity school, but it was somewhat, it was a calling. Now people make fun of lawyers being so greedy and everything. And, but that, lawyers had a good image, maybe the best image they've ever had right there after the Second World War. So, and that was a compromise between a, completely a life of the mind, that is a scholarly life, and a life of business affairs. And so I thought, well, I'll go to law school if I like it. And my father had gone to law school, my great-grandfather had been a judge, et cetera. So I had some of that in the background, but it was kind of a compromise. And I think one of the, at that age, I was thinking pretty straight about it. I'm surprised. <laughs> And so you you started at Harvard. You didn't like that. Two months, I called Dean Wade on the phone. Dean Wade had basically created the Vanderbilt Law School after the Second World War. He was a great influence in my life thereafter. Um, and said, I made a mistake. I had already been admitted to Vanderbilt Law School, um, and I'd like to transfer. And he said, we've never had that happen. I'll take it up with the faculty. And he took it up with the faculty and called me back and said, come on. So I, trans I drove home from Harvard in the middle of the first semester before Thanksgiving, talked to the dean, and he told me what he thought I could catch up on and take in the first year, which is what I did. And so I went on then with Vanderbilt Law School. But I just didn't like it, and I knew, well, one of the things, this is typical, uh, if they're, they're, I hope this changed, but I, I just bought a new overcoat with a velvet collar for the cold weather in Cambridge. And I went over, you know, the first time it was cold and hung up my coat in the dining room and somebody stole it as soon as I, and I just wasn't used to that mentality, number one. Number two, if they assign something in a, in a uh, book somewhere, students would tear the page out so the other students couldn't read it. And I thought, this place has got a problem, and, and I don't want to put up with this, and so I transferred. So, uh, and I'm so glad I did. Did you, uh, what, what kind of experience did you have at Vanderbilt? Good, I thought it was great. I thought really, without going into detail, I, you know, I did well in school there, and I love the law. I got where it's, you know, law is applied history, and it combines English, English and history and philosophies. Law is a lot of moral philosophies. What it, you get right down to it. So anyway, it satisfied my desire for scholarship or thinking about things in a broad way. So I really, and Dean Wade became, so when I, when I graduated from law school, he asked me to join the faculty as a, sort of the janitor of the faculty, so to speak. And then he got, um, during that year in the fall, he got an ulcer. So I had to teach his courses as well as my courses. And it was a great experience. I, and I was not married at the time, I was working about 12, 15 hours to try to learn. And teaching a course is by far the best way to learn the subject. So you, uh, you graduated which year? 60. 60. And I was on the faculty, 60, 61, and decided that I might want to be a law teacher. So went to, back to Harvard Law School and got a master's of law. And then I did, I have taught more or less, not every year, but many years at Vanderbilt as an adjunct professor, teaching this and that. You know. So how did you like Harvard the second time around? It was much better. <laughs> <laughs> it was much better. And uh, do you like teaching? Yeah, I do. Tell us. I do like teaching. 
um, because the students are usually pretty interesting and uh, I don't know. Oh, I, I have to review things and go back. And right now I've been teaching uh, along with Brad McLean, who's a fellow teacher. Uh, I've been teaching a death penalty seminar. But I've taught everything from legal history to torts, restitution, <laughs> local government law, you know, lots of things. So we're talking about a very um, interesting period in history. Uh, the 50s, which were thought to be quiet, but where there were uh, rumblings of change, and the 60s, where the change began to be, uh, uh, where people began to understand some of that change. When Brown had already been decided before you went to law school, upcoming in the 60s were the Freedom Rides. Did you know at the time, or only in looking back, that this was uh, a period of uh, remarkable change. Looking back at the, you know, it takes a, <clears throat> a good bit of experience and a lot of reading of history to see the changes in American society and in the philosophy of people. And I would say that the period after the Second World War, after we became the dominant nation in the world, clearly, and after we had put together the Marshall Plan and after we had done many things was the most liberal period, and I'm talking about now philosophically um, in, the, in the sense of Madison and Jefferson and so on, uh, most liberal period of American history. And the Warren Court decided um, and did revolutionize the way Americans thought of the law, uh, not only in civil rights, but in civil liberties, criminal law, free speech, across the board. And that period lasted from the end of the war and certainly the beginning of the Warren Court days on the Supreme Court and the appointment of more liberal judges uh, lasted on up through most of the 70s. It began to tail off, but it was a, it was a very, in my view, it was kind of like the Enlightenment in France in the 1780s, uh, 90s, uh, the era of Voltaire and so on. It was a really interesting period that shaped Mer American life and still shapes American life, although we are now in a period of reaction, obviously, to, against some of that. Uh, so you were teaching. Uh, when did you uh, begin to think about going into uh, government service or private practice, coming out of the, the law school and, and into this practical part of life that you did? Pretty immediately, um, for a combination of reasons, um, Beverly Briley, who um, the law firm I went with immediately after I got back from Harvard was the Bolt firm, and they only had five or six lawyers. I was, I think, six or seven. And they had uh, had a lot to do with Metro Charter and done a lot of legal work. And so the partner there, when I got back, asked me to help him with uh, advising Briley and work on the Metro government and that was 1962, 1963. And so I did and then he, um, Mr. Hunt had a heart attack and so I got a chance to do a lot of the work because nobody else up there had been involved in it and I got to know Briley, who became the mayor, and so one day called me on the phone and um, asked me to come over there, and I did, and he said, I need someone who really understands how the Metro Charter works and how the Enabling Act that created the Metropolitan Government was put together and, and so on. Would you come over in the legal department? 
And so he said, my, the director of law is going to be my old friend Neil Brown. And they were in the war together. But he said to me, now Neil doesn't know about this, and he needs somebody who can really help him. So I went over there, and I was great because I was handling all this litigation that was attacking the Metro government, uh, you know, the sheriff's department, the this, that, the other, as well as doing a lot of other things. It was great experience and I did that for two and a half years and then uh, I got appointed U.S. District Attorney after that in 60, late 65. So I was U.S. District Attorney and they were, had four or five assistants and we handled the, we handled the legal business of the federal government in the Middle Tennessee. Um, which was 80% criminal in terms of workload and 20% civil. And, so, and of course, that was a new experience for me. I would never tried a criminal case, but I quickly learned how to try one <laughs> under, you know, my experience. So I went from Metro government to um, U.S. District Attorney, and I've Nixon was elected. I was appointed by Johnson, and um, um, you know the the J Department of Justice at that time was Ramsey Clark and Nick Katzenbach, uh, who succeeded Robert F. Kennedy, and so the Department of Justice was a liberal-minded institution. I mean, I'd get a call from Ramsey Clark and said, "Let's see if you can find an employment." Everything was new. The Employment Discrimination Act was new, various and sundry civil rights laws. So as a lawyer in the, as a U.S. attorney in the South, he felt like he had a clerk and them felt like they had a fellow, fellow traveler, so to speak. So they would get me to try to get a case on this or a case on that. So that was interesting. Then we had a lot of interesting criminal cases. And I, Nixon then got elected, so, um, I sent in my resignation, and he happily accepted it. <laughs> and uh, then I, I was thinking about running for mayor because Briley was thinking about not running. And it, it, he, had ser he was serving his second term, and he had a question in his mind whether he was going to run for a third term. So I talked to him, and he said, if I don't run, you know, you might think about it. And so that year after I left, I went out to Vanderbilt. The dean gave me a job out there on the faculty to decide what in life I wanted to do. Then I decided, well, didn't run for mayor because Briley decided he would, was going to run for mayor. And uh, then uh, I went into private practice. So I want to back up just a couple of things. When you speak of the Metro, then when was the statute when, or the uh, pass that, that combined the county and the city governments? The, the Metro Enabling Act, uh, first thing that happened was there was a constitutional provision uh, that allowed the legislature to create, to merge cities and counties into metropolitan areas, which was not permitted before the, the, the constitutional enabling provision was enacted. And then the, act, see that was in 53, and the act was adopted two or three years later, which allowed it. Then there was a vote in 58, and you had, in order to, to merge, you had to get concurrent majorities in the county outside the city and in the city, and it failed in 58. And then th there was another vote in, in 62 yeah, 62 and it passed. And then the elections were for the mayor and the council in late 62. And Briley ran against Ben West, both of whom were good people. Anyway, that's the way it got in. And then April 1, 1963 was the beginning point, the first day of uh, the effectiveness of the Metro merged government. And so everything had to be put together, school boards, everything. So then from uh, the Metro government, which was 
quite controversial as it was put into practice. That, that is resisted by lots of people. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Then you finish that. Then when uh, to be appointed uh, a U.S. attorney, you have to have some political backing. Oh, yeah. Do you not? Right, sure. What was your political backing, would you say? Well, Gore was, uh, Albert Gore Sr. was a senior uh, senator, and I knew him because his daughter, Nancy, and I had, she was a couple of years younger, but we had gone out, and I knew Pauline, her mother, and S Senator Gore, you know, as a boy growing up a little bit. And then um, uh, Ross Bass ran for the Senate in 64, and he asked me, I don't know why, to be the executive director, and Briley gave me a little leave of absence, to be the executive director of his campaign, and he beat Frank Clement and won. So he felt some obligation uh, if, and, and um, I, I had a friend named Bill Willis, who's a lawyer in Nashville, who's a great friend of mine, and I, and I said, Willis, you, you're, he was old than I, and I said, you're entitled to this U.S. attorney's thing, and he said, no, I want to stay in private practice, so all the, the liberals, and back then the, the Republicans didn't win any statewide. Uh, offices. It started shortly thereafter, but there was there were two divisions of the Democratic Party: the conservatives, kind of the old South, Ross Barnett, uh, more or less. I mean, we never had it that bad, and the liberals, who were who were Gore, Kefauver was the leader. He died. Ross Bass uh, was elected to serve his term. And so they were for me, and I got appointed, and I was 29 <laughs> at so, the time. And uh, so, you did you did, was your family uh, in, part of the Democratic Party uh, all along, or no, was this new? Never. My father was probably. Uh, I mean, he was in business. He had a, I wouldn't say a typical business point of view about government, uh, but no. Now, previously, long time generations before that, yes but not then. So you were in the, the beginnings sort of of this uh, more liberal movement of the Democratic Party in Tennessee. No, I wasn't in the beginnings because that was, I would say that was led by Keefe offer in 1948 ah. when they beat the Crump machine. I see. So, but, and my, I didn't develop, I didn't know whether I was a Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, what. I was interested in history and literature up until I went to Harvard Law School a second time and began to start having to think about, you know, what do I really think? What is my identity? And then I decided that uh, I was a liberal and uh, not a conservative. <laughs> so that's what happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, now let's dip back just a bit into uh, the, the personal side of your life. Uh, when were you, what year were you married? I see, Louise and I got married in 64. So during all, d during about this same, same time, you got married, and you have how many children? Three, two boys and a girl. And, they, and their names, and what did they do? Well, we had three, we had three children. Uh, after we got married, we had three children within two years, and no twins, three children within, what, two years and two or three months, which is a record, I think, or maybe, uh, but, uh, a son, Stroud, Gilbert Stroud, Merritt the third, who went to law school, and he lives in Nashville and is sort of takes care of his business. My daughter, then Louise Clark Merritt, who is a psychiatrist in Nashville and has a little four and a half year old daughter, and uh, then my youngest son, Eli Merritt, who lives in San Francisco. He's a psychiatrist and has two little boys who are eight and four. And he's married to a woman from Spain, Rosanna, who is a great artist and has got works of art in, in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in, in New York and so on. I mean, she's quite a good artist. 
Well, actually, I did notice on the list of, in your bi uh, biography that Stroud was born in February 1965 and Louise was born in December 1965. Yeah. I thought that was a mistake. Hey, no, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know quite how that happened. <laughs> and so the children were fairly young then when your wife died. Yes. And this is the time when your mother in particular was so helpful. Yes, right. Uh, so you, we're getting to the period when you move into private practice. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I went over to uh, Gullet, Steele, Sanford, Robinson, and then Merritt, which had been the law firm of Harry Phillips, who was then on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and about that time was the chief judge of the Sixth Circuit, but it had been Phillips, forgotten the exact name, but anyway, and um, I talked to uh, several law firms, but that firm gave me more leeway to do what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to work where I had to put my nose to the grindstone on things that I might not want to do. And uh, it was a time, as I said, when <clears throat> the law practice was even then different and you didn't have to just, the, 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 the whole idea of discovery and spending your life taking depositions didn't exist. It was changing, but anyway. So I did primarily at that firm from 1971 to, yeah, 1977. Uh, <clears throat> I did federal litigation for the most part because I had been the U.S. District Attorney and so I did a good bit of that kind of work. Primar I guess primarily I did federal litigation, both criminal and civil. And do you remember in particular any cases? Yeah, there's one still going on. <laughs> uh, there was a, for, exa for example, there was a hijacking case where the uh, a guy hijacked an airplane, kidnapped his wife, and was a uh, big brother aircraft, had this plane, and uh, Downs, Brent Downs was the pilot. And to make a long story short, when the plane, they ordered the plane to go to Nassau, and when it got to Jacksonville, Florida, they had to refuel and got on the ground, and the FBI intervened and shot the tires on the airplane and some into the fuselage of the airplane and the hijacker killed the pilot. Then he was a crazy nut uh, in many ways. He killed the pilot. He then killed his estranged wife. Anybody else? And so um, the Downs family and Big Brother Aircraft and so on hired me to see what could be done about it, and I sued the government of the United States really for the conduct of the FBI, and we had one Donnybrook of a case uh, that lasted two or three years, and finally um, I got the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals reverse the district court's judgment in favor of the FBI and we won the case. Not as, we didn't get as much money as we should have, but anyway. <laughs> and right now, Brent Downs' son, Andy Downs, who a year or two ago got interested in his father's case, he's an intelligent young man, or I don't know exactly how old he is now, but anyway, he has now found, he thinks, that one of the bullets in his father was a bullet from the FBI pistol that ricocheted or did something. That's what he thinks. And so he has now hired a lawyer. So that he's now hired a lawyer to see if there's anything he can do about that. So that case, I say, is, that was 1972, 3, 4. 
that case is still going on, or may still be going on. Anyway, it was a great case, and the government fought tooth and nail, I, they, I've, to some extent unfairly, but uh, that is, they wouldn't turn over information they were supposed to turn over. Hoover uh, was embarrassed by it. Hoover had written a... Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, yeah. the head of the FBI? Yeah, he was then head of the FBI. He, uh, he, he, he had written the rule or regulation that said to his FBI people, you may not intervene without the consent of the pilot or the owner of the aircraft. They got nobody's consent. They intervened, shot up the tires and so on, and uh, then they tried to cover up the regulation because it was an internal regulation. They wouldn't e even disclose it. I mean, it was a fight. It was a real fight. But, and so, that was one of the more interesting ones, I would say, but I had some other interesting cases while I was in private practice. What did you like most? Uh, we, we're go we'll take a break in a, just a moment or two, but what did you like most in private practice? The litigation and f fighting for something I thought was right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I thought that was right. And then uh, there were other cases where I was defending some criminal uh, somebody charged with a criminal offense that I thought were was unfair, and there was the the tactics of uh, trying to, you know, give your client the best representation. Uh, so, um, I mean, I had a number of Morris Mills, this guy who was a contractor, and he was accused uh, down in Memphis. I got appointed to defend him of. Uh, bank fraud and he was really, he was extorted into making a payment to a bank in order to get a loan. He didn't want to make a payment. Well, that was a big Donnybrook too. So, you know, there were, I, and I thought he was being mistreated. I really, um, I really, um, I still do like the idea of probing a case until you can see what the justice of the case is and then have at it, you know, and, and, and not be afraid to uh, assert yourself in that connection. I think now is a good time. Okay, <laughs> good. Judge Merritt, um, did you run for political office or have political ambitions at any time? Yes, I, I've always been ambivalent about uh, whether being an elected politician was a good thing for me temperamentally, but I did, I ran, first time I ran uh, was for the Constitutional Convention, which is the same basically as the legislature, and that was 1964. And then, I, let's see, that Constitutional Convention was 1965, and the convention was made up of 99 people, which is the same as the lower house, um, the General Assembly. And we revised the Constitution of Tennessee having to do with uh, the primarily the legislative branch and I won't go into detail about it. We had a two or three months worth of debate about what to do. Uh, it followed up on Baker versus Carr and some other things that uh, prompted it. Baker versus Carr setting the one person, one vote. Right. So anyway, um, that was an interesting experience. I had also, for Metro, been the lawyer for Metro in the legislature, uh, so I knew a little bit about how the le legislature worked. It was a much smaller operation then, and I drafted, I had drafted uh, for a good bit of legislation in connection with uh, Metro. Uh, but anyway, um, I did that, and then in 1975, um, I see Richard Fulton um, was the congressman in Davidson County. 
the old Hermitage District, as we say, and he ran for mayor uh, to succeed Briley, and um, his seat was open, and a number of people said to me, and I thought independently of that, well, I might, I might get elected, and so I decided to run, and one of the reasons a number of people uh, said you ought to run is because I really had not gotten over my wife's death quite, and I was having a hard time somewhat psychologically. I mean, that's a very depressive event, <laughs> depressing event. So um, I thought myself, well, taking a couple months out and running for Congress and so on. But then Clifford Allen decided he would run. Clifford has a long history in politics and was an older man, and he certainly knew a lot more about it than I did. And he, as I say, I knew him, and he told me afterward, I, I almost called you and told you and to tell you that I had this poll, and, and you were known, uh, according to this poll, about, by about 10%, mainly just as a result of being a uh, U.S. attorney, and I was known by 98%, <laughs> most all of which was favorable, because he had gotten, it was, anyway, it's a long story, but he had gotten a lot of things done. He was the county tax assessor, and he had, Clifford was great at getting publicity, and he got people a, a refund on their taxes and this and that. Anyway, and Clifford, he, he, he sort of let it come out slowly that he was thinking about it. And I remember he went to church over in East Nashville and he came out and had a press conference there in which he, and he had not announced, I had already announced, not announced in the press conference. He said, you know, I'm thinking very seriously about this and it reminds me of the song they sang in church today, Almost Persuaded, Oh My Lord. <laughs> so I knew he was going to run. Anyway, I got beat pretty substantially, but it was, uh, it was um, a little depressing for several months, but I think it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I found out that elective politics is not for me. When they asked me a question, "Are you? what do you think about guns and gun control? I said, I think we ought to get rid of pistols and so on. What do you think about abortion? I think a woman has a right to choose. What do you think? And I just told them whatever I thought. Well, I have now found out and found out as a result of that. I told some of my friends who were for me, Sigenthaler, for example, John, I don't think I'll ever run for public office, but if I do, the public will never know what I really think. <laughs> because that's just, unfortunately, you've got to take a poll, and then you, you're, what you say has got to be consistent with what the public thinks, or they are, you know, I mean, and I think maybe back in the early days of the Founding Fathers, maybe not, that there was more leeway given to a politician to be a leader and to, uh, but maybe not, maybe it's always been the same. But anyway, I decided that I don't think this is for me. And I'm not any good at it. I don't like campaigning and so on. So, But it was a good experience. So then you became a, a judge. You were appointed. Uh, how did that develop? Where did you want to be a judge? Had you thought of it a long time? Who approached you? Tell us that story. Well, yes. Uh, when, I was, when I was with Metro, I did a lot of litigation, and I did a lot of litigation in the Chancery Court, um, which, you know, is a somewhat more cerebral litigation, a lot of it having to do with validity of Metro, other things. And uh, Ned Lentz, uh, whose father I actually represented as a lawyer for Metro because he was the director of the Department of Health, but Ned Lentz was a chancellor, and I started thinking then, you know, this is a, a pretty good thing to do, and my great-grandfather had been a chancellor in Davidson County when there was one chancellor. And uh, so I thought about it at that time. Then when I was U.S. District Attorney, I was in court all the time, 
And we had two very good judges uh, during that period, uh, Bill Miller and Frank Gray. And uh, they were, and I thought, well, you know, this interesting work. And so, but uh, what then happened was after I'd been in practice uh, uh, in 76, there was a vacancy on the Court of Appeals. Bill Miller, who was elevated from the District Court to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, ha died. And that was vacant, and it was vacant for a substantial period of time because he died just as the election of 60, I mean, the election of 76 was coming on. So when Carter got elected uh, in 76, the vacancy existed, and I had helped Carter in Tennessee, uh, raised, you know, money for him and um, done a good bit. Uh, and that's one reason I went with that law firm, because the, the, I, I didn't have to account for all my time. I could go participate in things I wanted to participate in. So then um, I put my name in, and um, Carter did something that no other president has ever done. He created these blue ribbon commissions to uh, ask people who wanted a work on a court of appeals to submit an application and to rank the people, and supposedly without regard to politics, but in fact there was a good bit of politics involved. So I applied for the job and there were a lot, quite a few people um, who were supporting me, I would say, in a quiet sort of way, who had some influence. And um, we had a, um, we, the, this commission that made, uh, it was the first commission because the Sixth Circuit had two vacancies and they were existing when Carter came into office. So the Sixth Circuit had the first commission. And uh, so I went up there and talked to the commissioners, and we got into a conversation that lasted. I mean, most people went up there and had 30 minutes, and I don't know, we had an hour and a half or two hour conversation because they got interested in an article I had written in the Vanderbilt Law Review not too long before that about legal philosophy and about the philosophy of a fellow named John Rawls. And so this was a pretty good group of people, really. So we had a big discussion about that that lasted a long time, and that was very helpful. It just kind of was a spontaneous discussion that came about. And so when they sent their recommendations in, they had to send their recommendations in to the White House, bypassing the Department of Justice, which really usually handles mo most of this. And, and they, they had to rank the people, and so they ranked me number one. And the other person I was really, I mean, there were f several others they put in the group, but Bailey Brown, who's a very good district judge from Memphis, mm -hmm. uh, chief judge of the district court down there, was my competition, really, the only real competition. And um, Bailey was more conservative, and this was a, a fairly liberal group of people. And so, anyway, push came to shove, and uh, the president, and particularly uh, Rosalind Carter, whom I had met, and I worked in that campaign to some extent, she was helpful too. <laughs> And so they, he appointed me. And then, uh, you know, you go before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and uh, there were some questions I asked about this, that, or the other, but it, the confirmation was not particularly difficult. And I think in the end it was unanimous. But that was back in the day when it wasn't so controversial. As it I is noticed today. it took a couple of months between the time. Uh, the <clears throat> It took a couple of months for once the nomination was made, and then you got confirmed. So not yeah. any long process. No, it wasn't a long process, but there was uh, some opposition from Memphis be because of they, you know, who's this young fellow from Nashville, who the 
president has nominated instead of this very fine senior member of the judiciary. Now, how old were you at this time? Let's see, uh, 1940. So um, you were moving from just straight from private practice into an appeals court position. Yeah. Was that unusual? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, there had been others, but yes, a little bit. Not entirely, though, no. I would say that wasn't particularly controversial, but there was a tendency to some extent to, like Bill Miller or others, to elevate a district judge uh, there. Of course, you had been in the U.S. Attorney's Office, had done a significant amount of federal litigation, yeah. so there was a different kind of background. I knew what I was doing in court, yeah. Um, so uh, when you, you, when did you actually begin as a judge? When were you sworn October in? October of 1977. And uh, where, were, where were your first offices? Were they here in, in Nashville? an office uh, over in the uh, federal building, now called whatever it is, the Kefauver building, uh, there on 8th and Broad. Um, and then in Cincinnati, had an office because the court met in Cincinnati almost in exclusively. And um, we then were meeting 15 weeks out of the year, and the schedule was quite different from the court schedule now, and the work was considerably different from the work of the court today in that we had 1,200 cases then, the court has about 7,000 now, and the cases were more heavily civil than, than they are now. Uh, at least 50% of the caseload now has something to do with criminal work then that was probably 20, 20, 20 percent or 25. So it's changed over time, but I had an office in Cincinnati, and of course my children were then a little older, but I had to go to, when I had to go to Cincinnati, I always came home on the weekend uh, because of that. And some of the judges and the wives usually went, this was back in the day, just beginning uh, where women were being uh, becoming um, lawyers and then judges, and of course that's picked up a lot of steam, but then it was just in the beginning of that process, and uh, so the you, all the judges on the court when I went on there were male. Then Cornelia Kennedy uh, was appointed, and she was a Republican and very conservative Republican. There was a lot of opposition among the Democrats. But Carter appointed her anyway because he wanted to appoint women. He wanted to appoint, he wanted to have a more diverse federal judiciary. So she was appointed not with well, a year or so after I was. But there were no women on there and the wives came to Cincinnati with the judges. And there was a lot of camaraderie despite party differences, let us say. There's a lot of camaraderie. Uh, the whole system has changed considerably when it comes to collegiality, uh, et cetera, I would say. I want to come back to that, but bef before we do, I want to back up and say, how did you learn to be a judge? Trial and error. <laughs> uh, the, they had a little school um, the summer after I was appointed um, and that was uh, in New York at NYU, but that was that was only marginally helpful. You know, you learn beginning in law school about how the process works and deciding cases at the appellate level uh, is a process that most lawyers l learn something about because the case method is uh, the method that is used in law school, reading cases. And, uh, and I was interested in the English judiciary and how the common law developed, and I had taught 
uh, at Vanderbilt Law School, English legal history time or two, and uh, I understood that law, I thought, thought I understood at least, that law basically is an expression of a culture and that um, it's applied history. And so I didn't, I probably should have felt more humble going into it than I did. <laughs> but, but um, you know, you learn pretty quickly. You once said to me, uh, law is high, much of law is high common sense. Yeah, <laughs> but it's common sense after you have developed some intellect. Yes. <laughs> Not just common sense no, on high the street. Common sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you have law clerks then? Uh, when you, uh, d uh, how many law clerks did you have? How did you choose them beginning, in those days? Beginning in 77, I had two law clerks, both of whom were great, Henry Walker and Lee Breckenridge. Henry is a lawyer in Nashville now. Henry was then in the Department of Justice, and I had known Henry because he went to Yale, and I, had, when I was U.S. Attorney, written a letter of recommendation for Henry, and his father, Hugh Walker, who was an editorial writer for the Tennessee, and I knew. So I knew Henry kind of wanted to come back to Nashville, and I called him on the phone and said, Henry, uh, do you want to come back and be a law clerk, and then decide, do what you want to do? And Henry said, yes, but, would you hire my girlfriend? And his girlfriend, <laughs> girlfriend was Lee Breckenridge, who had been practically first in the class. He, Henry had gone to Yale and Harvard Law School, and Lee had gone from, uh, to uh, Harvard Law School. She was practically first in the class, and she was a great law clerk. She's now teaching environmental law in Boston. Uh, but so they were my first two law clerks. So I had two law clerks. Then they expanded. We expanded to three, then to four, as the workload kept going up. And then when I was chief judge there for seven years, I think for a while I had five law clerks. Um, so yeah, that's the way it went. So one of the two first law clerks was a woman. Yeah. Uh, and you had Henry got her the job. <laughs> <laughs> Not so you aren't to be credited. With that. <laughs> no. <laughs> but but you, I but I found out she was extremely smart, and I ought to hire more women, and did in the future. Sometimes I'd have all women. Uh, I had one year where I think I had four women as law clerks. People thought, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a, ch a change in the whole landscape of of the law practice because before when you went to law school, how many women were in your class? Two out of about a hundred. And But Dean Wade had integrated, first he integrated um, racially the law school. Nothing at Vanderbilt was integrated. And he talked the Board of Trust into integrating the black, you know, racially, the Vanderbilt Law School in about 50, four or five. So he had done that and he was also wanted to have more women but there weren't very many women applying mm -hmm. until slightly later, mm -hmm. somewhat later. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's all we had in my class there. So uh, as you ran an office uh, as both in Nashville and in Cincinnati, was it complex to run an office in both places? What What role did the uh, office of the the administrative office of the courts play uh, in helping you run your office. Well, they provide the library and so on, but that's about it. Uh, at that time, uh, I had my secretary or assistant or whatever you want to say, uh, Sarah Pettit, who is still with me. She had been my secretary for a couple of years and she had gone to law school but never practiced law. And she, she's a, a terrific, as you know, uh, from being there, she, uh, Sarah is a wonderful person and she also is a terrific assistant. So I give her a lot of credit for helping get things organized. You do have to organize the office and see how you're gonna keep up with the cases and that kind of thing. But that's not all that difficult, I would say. It's, it's, you, 
you've got to have a system and you do have to develop an attitude that you've got to decide these cases. Now you can take a lot of time, but you know, these cases run all the way from 30 minutes because it's an easy problem to three or four months because it's a very difficult problem, both factually and legally. So, I mean, you have to decide what the problem or problems in the case are and how, you know, how much detail and time, and of course the law clerks help a lot, but in the end you have to try to understand it yourself. <laughs> you, they can help you a lot, but you, it's, uh, you have to internalize it, and it means over the years you do learn a considerable amount about a whole lot of different areas of the law and of life. And I think then maybe more than now because arbitration has taken, we've lost the appellate jurisdiction in the patent cases, which I used to love, and some other appellate jurisdiction because of arbitration, we don't see those kind of cases anymore. And so some of the most interesting civil cases we've lost which I'm sorry about, <laughs> but uh, you do have to, over time, you build up some general understanding of various areas of the law that you might not otherwise. And, and the federal judges, uh, court of appeals judges are one of the few sectors of the <laughs> economy and so on that is a very general. We're generalists. We're not specialists. Although we might specialize, let's say, in federal jurisdiction problems or procedural type things. Um, but generally speaking, federal, certainly Court of Appeals judges and certainly Supreme Court and I think district judges, to some extent at least, are generalists and some of the few legal generalists left because, you know, they used to be true of practicing law, but now we are so specialized with a few exceptions. Now, the other generalists, I would say, would be some of the academics, uh, but, you know, even in the ac academia, uh, there's a high degree of specialization, and a lot of academics, they, they wouldn't ever have a need to learn anything about patent law or this or that, you know. So what did you like about the patent cases? Well, the patent law is really pretty easy in the general, uh, in, the, in the legislation. We are applying a statute that patent uh, law emanates from a constitutional provision about patents and copyrights, and that is not hard to understand. What is hard to understand is oftentimes the technology and the science, and I thought it was a lot of times it's very interesting to try to understand how inkjet printing works exactly and why there's a either is or is not an infringement of a patent. Those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you said a while ago that, it, that at first most of the cases were civil but now the, the criminal portion of the docket has grown. Uh, what, is, what has caused that development? Well, the war on drugs is one factor. The, the tough on drugs, tough on we're going to send people to jail more is another factor that uh, came about. To make a long story short, if you look at uh, the people incarcerated in the United States, there are now two million, I think the figure now is two million three hundred thousand in 1980, there were less than a half million in the federal prisons, correction system, Bureau of Prisons. In 1980, there were, I think it was 15,000. Now there are 210 or 15,000. Now, that is the result of a number of factors, one of which is this idea of sentencing guidelines. When I went on the bench, there were no sentencing guidelines. There was no appeal from a sentence. Uh, if it was within the statutory framework of the maximum, and what the appeals in those cases w w only had to do with a trial of a case and whether the evidence had been 
you know, various and sundry evidentiary type problems and trial problems. But now most of the appeals have to do with sentencing and the system is broken badly. Now, um, when the sentencing guidelines were first instituted, though called guidelines, they were treated as absolute rules. Yes. Do you think there's been, um, it, do you think that more recent developments have improved that? Well, there's been some improvement when the Supreme Court decided the Booker case and some other cases mm -hmm. Uh, that made the guidelines not so mandatory, I made them more discretionary. That's been so somewhat helpful, but in the meantime, the judges got used to their, uh, not all judges, but district judges got used to them being mandatory, and they've had a hard time escaping that. My, if I had my way, I would abolish the guidelines altogether, go back to the old system, uh, that we had that worked extremely well. And it was just a bunch of false prophets, if you ask me, who got the system changed. Unfortunately, they were on both sides of the equation, liberal and conservative, Democrat and Republican, and they thought there was something wrong with the way the system was working then. And it, there, there, there's more disparity of sentencing now, in my view, just watching the cases come than there was then where the, the there was no appeal of any sentence. But uh, that is uh, like whistling Dixie. I mean, that's not gonna, that's not gonna change, but I wish it were. I, I think the sentencing guidelines, one, have caused this huge increase in prison costs, in huge numbers of people incarcerated because the states have followed the, the guideline system for the most part and have followed the notion of the uh, federal sentencing guidelines that everybody ought to go to jail for a much longer period of time, rehabilitation is out, and so on. So I'm, I, uh, if, I could, if I could change it all myself, that's what I would do, but that's not going to happen. So, uh, when judge, before the guidelines, clearly judges must have had some kind of framework in yeah. which they d decided sentences. Of course, there's the statutory framework, but is there, was there anything else that guided the discretion? Yeah, the judges, district judges, went to school about um, broad principles of sentencing, deterrence, retribution, rehabilitation, and there, there, there came to be a common understanding after a while of the principles. Now some judges were more lenient than other judges, um, and so there was some disparity there. But it was a disparity, I think, that was healthy based on application of principles for the most part and when the guidelines came along, and I testified against having the guidelines, and then after it was clear they're going to have them, I testified in favor of broad discretion for the judges um, because we had never had any mandatory rule bound. And these guidelines are so rule bound, you wouldn't believe it. Page after page of rules. A grid. Grids, yeah. So I said, you know, the English, American uh, English legal system has never had anything like this before. And, and we can't go from a system where the judges take into account certain broad principles to a system of mandatory, very detailed rules. It, it's not gonna work. Well, that's what they did. They didn't pay any attention to me and others who said the same thing, some others, because there was just this Tea Party movement, if you want to call it that, back about sentencing. And everybody just got in a tizzy about judges uh, sentencing people and having discretion, and that judges, you know, Nixon had been saying for a long time, judges soft on crime, and we gotta toughen up, and this and that. 
So uh, that whole mentality took over and to some extent is still with us, but it is easing slightly, I think, right now, primarily because of the huge costs that we've wrecked on ourselves as a result of this system since it went into effect in 87. Economics speaks. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, humaneness has m little to do with it, but economics talks loudly. <laughs> I thought when I knew of the Booker case, I thought of you instantly, since I am familiar with your view of the sentencing guidelines. Right. Okay, so let's move on to an another question. I, I have asked you before, um, what cases do you see out of the U.S. Supreme Court, particularly, that you think everyone, regardless of particular philosophy, by now everyone would say were wrongly decided? Well, the first one um, was clearly Dred Scott. I don't know who might defend that, but that is the case that said blacks cannot are not and cannot be citizens. They're inferior beings and deserve to be in slavery. That's what Tony and the Tony Court said in 1858, I guess it was. It was after, that's the first case I know of that I would say is just completely wrongly decided. Now, after that, uh, there are not too many the cases, uh, are, would, some of them would have some defense by some people. The civil rights cases in which uh, Harlan dissented and, and which really read uh, much of the civil rights. These are the slaughterhouse. Uh, yeah, out of the law. Uh, I think they were wrongly decided and probably most people who are familiar with constitutional law would say that. Uh, Lochner versus New York, 19, when they were 10, uh, which said that the due process clause forbids the states from minimum wage laws and child labor laws and all that. Uh, I think most people would say that was bad. There are a few people still who would defend it, I guess, but. Um, there were then a line of cases following Lochner that pr kind of applied Lochner and prevented the state governments and the federal government from regulation uh, so that by the time we get to Roosevelt, uh, the Supreme Court is holding the National Recovery Act unconstitutional and other uh, New Deal legislation. and. You know, for that reason, Roosevelt wanted to pack the Supreme Court, 1937, which was very unpopular, but the pressures there and the little change in the court, which is called the, the rule of what to save nine, the switch in time, time to nine. save nine, uh, changed that to some extent, and so that Supreme Court became very, um, became much more liberal than it had been and reversed the Lochner type policies. Uh, then following that we went through uh, the, um, the Japanese incarceration case would everyone I think now would agree that was poorly decided case. Um, but we can understand if the the threat of the Japanese attacking California is there. A lot of people would be frightened. And you can perhaps, just in terms of security, uh, justify that, although it was totally racial, ethnic racial basis for it. And I think most people would now say, we've, we've gotten too big for that. We're, but I don't know, looking around the way things are today, whether they would or not. Anyway. Uh, Following up, you know, there are other cases. You can come on down to Bush v. Gore, which in my view has no justification whatsoever, a purely politically decided case, and on down to last year. I'm, I, I disagree strongly with the whole line of cases that money is speech and that the Congress of the United States cannot regulate for campaign finance. 
And, you know, we've seen a series of cases from Buckley v. Vallejo beginning in 1975 down to the Citizens United case last year that says free speech and money in politics spent on campaigns is synonymous. And I don't think that founding fathers would turn over in their grave. They, uh, I think, they would say, well, that's not what free speech means in the and, First Amendment. And you, I think, uh, believe that that decision is uh, harmful. Absolutely. I, I think unless it's changed, it's going to be the downfall of our democratic form of government. The reason is it allows everybody with money, because people who are poor don't have any money, to finance the campaigns of those people they want to see in Congress, for example, and in the Senate. And they can spend money without regulation because they may be only able to give X number of dollars, giving it to the candidate directly, but all they have to do is go out and buy the advertising and so on. So there is no limitation on what Wall Street can spend on hiring uh, their own congressmen and senators or what the oil companies can spend. They can spend ad infinitum. And we've never had that in the United States. We, until recently, corporations and unions could not spend money in, in campaign finance. Now it's open season. And if you go long enough where only the wealthy have a real role in financing campaigns and people in politics have to have money in order to run because of the way our culture works with regard to TV, et cetera, you're going to have government uh, by the wealthy. That's inevitable. And I mean, that's the way it was in England in the 17th and 18th century, you know, before a guy who didn't have a considerable amount of land could vote. So we've gotten away from that and we had a good system until this change has occurred in the way the Supreme Court says, and that's, you know, that's a five to four kind of decision, but I don't think it's going to be changed anytime soon. And particularly once you get people in office who want to have the rich, and, and I don't mean just the individual rich, although the Koch brothers and others are good examples, um, but business that wants to buy their laws involved in campaigns. Well, that's going to destroy the country, in my view, sooner or later, if, unless it's changed. Now, uh, with that, that's a fairly pessimistic view of one area of the development of the law. Uh, what is your view of um, the development in the access to justice uh, the, the law for access of justice? Well, uh, we've had a lot of improvement uh, going back to the beginning of the 20th century or even mid 20th century in the sense of public defenders, you know. When I started practicing law, there, wasn't, there were no public defenders. I got appointed, you know, to handle habeas cases and stuff and, and without it was the blind leading the blind, so to speak. Uh, and there, were, there was no system of um, representation for the poor in the civil cases. <clears throat> now that has changed to some extent. Um, and those changes are good. Uh, a lot of those changes are because women have come in, into the legal profession and they are oftentimes more idealistic than men. Um, I wouldn't say that categorically, but, um, and are looking for some way to uh, do good and in their in a pro bono sense. So I think there have been a lot of factors, a change in the attitude of society. I mean, if we go back to 1932 and look at the Scottsboro Boys cases, where they were railroaded in uh, Scottsboro, Alabama, 
and given the death penalty, which was totally unjust. They didn't do what they were accused of doing and had to go through a whole process where most of them stayed in jail, prison, for many years before one or two died in prison, uh, where there was no real legal representation. Supreme Court said in Powell versus Alabama uh, that in a death case, you've got to provide effective counsel. So for the first time, that's 1932, we begin that process and has grown since then. So now we have much more effective, uh, and, and, and other things have been improvement. The Supreme Court's uh, 70s case on the death penalty, Furman against Georgia and a whole line of cases after that, had started off as being a great improvement. Looked like we were gonna get rid of the death penalty, but we didn't, but we've cut back on it. Now there's been move the other direction to some extent because this court we've got now is much more conservative than the court was in the 70s and when we started cutting back on the death penalty. So uh, there have been there have been a lot of positive uh, moves. Uh, you, ha you have mentioned a couple of times that you uh, have an interest in death penalty cases that you're teaching this uh, course, co-teaching with Brad McLean. Uh, Tell us about your interest and why you want to do that teaching. Well, I got into it because our court started getting a lot of death penalty cases, beginning in, when? 80s, late 80s, I guess it was. See, there was a moratorium on the death penalty for a while. It takes a while for a state death penalty case to get to the federal courts and get to the Court of Appeals. So it must have been then, and I started getting two or three or four cases and I realized that I had not thought through this very well. I didn't really know much about it and I, I've known f for many years the best way to find out is to teach it. Then you got to concentrate then and read the literature and think about it and get others, people in the class to give you some good ideas. So I started teaching it and I got into it and read you know, history of the death penalty and how we got it and so on. And by the, by the, this time, all the European nations, all the um, nations that belong to the European Union had abolished the death penalty. It's abolished under the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. They, you can't be in the European Union and can continue to have the death penalty. And the European Union won't even extradite people to the United States who are charged with a capital crime. And, and they think we're barbaric in continuing, you know, the Pope has now condemned it. I mean, most, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, whoever. But because we are a local, because the death penalty is a local problem uh, administered by the states, now there's 16 states that have abolished the death penalty. Uh, it's, it's very hard to eliminate it entirely, and now we have a Supreme Court that at least seems to be uh, considerably pro-death penalty, uh, and are recently kind of reinstating some of the things that look like they were going to go by the boards. So, uh, kind of that's where we are. But I, I don't see any reason. I'm a, the Pope, Pope John Paul, wrote the best thing about the death penalty I know of, the encyclical Evangelium Vitae, and he explained why he was against it. And his basic reason was we don't need this anymore to protect society. We've got the possibility of imprisonment without parole. We can keep these people incarcerated. and. Uh, why are we, and you run a significant risk of uh, executing innocent people. Uh, some percentage of the people we've executed clearly are innocent. Um, so I, I agree with that. I don't really see the point of continuing into the future a retributive, uh, administering a retributive sort of 
retribution when we don't really need it and when it's so arbitrarily administered. I mean, the same case in Texas gets it this way and in some other state gets it that way. Same exact case. No equal protection, whatever. Totally arbitrary, disparate treatment. So for those reasons, I, ha I, I have serious doubts about it. Would you cite any international court or justice uh, opinions or the encyclical uh, in a case? Well, they don't have it in Europe anymore, and so the International Court of Justice, um, Human Rights Court in Strasbourg, doesn't really have to deal with death penalty cases. Uh, there have been there have been a, a lot of people in Europe who have brought about this change in the law, some in England. Mm -hmm. You know, Great Britain had the death penalty for years and sometimes very harshly administered. But I, nobody, uh, I, fr from what I've read, the best thing in moral terms, in historical terms, in theoretical and philosophical terms, is what the Pope wrote. And would you say that in an opinion? I think maybe I've incited, I've cited, I think I have cited uh, Evangelium Vitae. There's another uh, circumstance that, uh, that connected to your work as a judge, um, the John Demyanyuk case, or yeah. a series of cases. Uh, you would tell us about that. It was a travesty on justice, uh, which I participated in. And um, he was accused of being Ivan the Terrible at Treblinka, who gassed, uh, killed in the Holocaust um, thousands of Jews. And the Department of Justice uh, got the Israel Israeli Attorney General to seek extradition of Demyonyuk into Israel to be tried for crimes against humanity. And the Department of Justice, the Office of Special Investigations, which is the Nazi hunters, really, my understanding is they are the ones who suggested to the Israelis that they seek extradition of this guy. And they talked the uh, State Department into uh, seeking the extraditions. The State Department has to get involved. So we got the case, and I took home a, over the weekend a huge pile of boxes with all this in there, and um, I thought this is, a, this is a thin case because everybody who says Demyonyuk is the guy it, they were uh, prisoners 30, 40 years ago. They're looking at photographs even there. Anyway, I just thought it was a thin case. But finally, my law clerks to some extent uh, talked me into believing that my discretion was very narrow in these extradition cases. And I guess it probably was. So we extradited the guy. He gets tried sentenced to death in a big show trial in Israel as Ivan the Terrible. Now it's appealed and it's before the Israeli Supreme Court. And thank God for the Attorney General who was in Israel who had won what is comparable to their Congressional Medal of Honor in the Seven Days War and he got the word he might have the wrong man. So he sent investigators to the Ukraine where Demyonyuk was from, and he was Demyonyuk had been um, put into the Russian army, and he was captured by the Germans in the Crimea at that campaign. And anyway, make a long story short, turns out that Ivan the Terrible was not Demyonyuk; he was another guy and the Department of Justice did not turn over all the information they had to us about uh, the fact that there was another guy who 
more than likely was Ivan the Terrible. And it was a failure to turn over exculpatory information. It was a concealment of facts. And it infuriated my panel, which was me and Pierce Lively and Damon Keith. And, and to make a long story short, we raised so much Cain in opinions after the fact that he was permitted to come back to the United States. Janet Reno, the Attorney General, didn't, she wouldn't, who, she, the Attorney General was in charge of immigration coming into the country. She didn't want to allow him in because of all the pressure on the Department of Justice. And, and so I wrote an opinion saying I had to let him back in. The Solicitor General sought uh, certiorari and the Supreme Court turned it down the same day. They didn't want to fool with it. So that case is one of the great travesties and is a case that w w makes you look carefully at whatever government does in the way of prosecutions to be sure that there is not some political pressure, some something that is uh, in, uh, influencing it unfairly. And, uh, so this was not a case about whether John Dumanyuk had done bad things. No. This was a case about whether he was Ivan at Treblinka the Terrible. And, and was Ivan the Terrible. And the guy who was in charge of the gas chambers. And you know, it, he just was innocent of that. And no question about it now. But he might well have been executed but for this courageous attorney general who nobody could in Israel could accuse of not being patriotic, he was willing to put his, he was willing to be courageous. Now this, uh, your work on this case uh, took some um, toll on your reputation as a judge and on your uh, possibly being considered as a Supreme Court nominee, I believe. Yeah, it had some influence on that. Clinton had an interest and when R Ruth Ginsburg was appointed finally to that, um, I, I was supposed to be at the top of the list for a while, two or three weeks, and send them all that information. And um, But, you know, as Scalia, I was talking to him, said, you know, getting appointed to the Supreme Court is like shooting craps, rolling dice. It is a highly political process. Yeah, and a bunch of people because of Demyonyuk and wasn't the only thing, but the Peter Principle to some extent maybe, <laughs> uh, uh, were against me. And uh, I think it was, uh, I've forgotten, Bernay Brith and the Anti-Defamation League and Abram Foxman and a bunch of people, you know, got in touch once they heard about it in the White House and I think Clinton said, well, just mark his name off, you know, I'm not going to get in a fight about over this, so. Aside from this. So I, I guess it had something, but I don't, I don't know who, nobody deserves or doesn't deserve that kind of thing. You know, appointment to the Supreme Court is purely, uh, purely uh, political process that there are a number of people I can think of I'd rather have appointed than myself. So <laughs> I have a good, had a good friend, Richard Arnold, who was almost appointed by Clinton. Uh, he was a very close and dear friend of mine, and he's the one who said to Clinton, he's from Arkansas, Clinton considered Richard first, and because of the Whitewater problem, told Richard since he was from Arkansas that he would not appoint him then because he would be, Clinton would be uh, accused of cronyism. And so he asked Richard who should he, who else would he recommend? And he recommended me, Richard. We were in the same class at Yale together. And Richard was one of the, he, he's the best judge I've ever known. Uh, really terrific. Uh, now, but he judges. died, <laughs> unfortunately. He would have been appointed when Breyer was appointed, except he had um, a form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the doctor couldn't give him a clean bill of health. But Clinton, second time around, would have appointed Richard, no question about it. Uh, 
aside from that kind of question, I know that the, the people certainly misunderstood your point of view uh, about, about these cases. Uh, and it is, it, it is true sometimes that judges uh, have to take courageous actions regardless of how it's going to be viewed. Who are some of the judges that, that come to your mind who took courageous actions regardless of an unpopular kind of ruling? Well, I think the Warren Court people, you know, there were billboards all up everywhere around the country, impeach Earl Warren, and the other P. I think those judges were uh, Warren particularly, but Brennan and uh, others on the court were uh, courageous judges. I think that John Marshall was a courageous judge when he uh, basically took on uh, took on uh, Jefferson um, in Marbury versus Madison essentially and was condemned for it and obviously as it's turned out everybody would agree that that was a good decision um, I'll give you an example that is not well known of a courageous judge in the Scottsboro boys case uh, Judge Horton tried the second round of the Scottsboro Boys. He tried two of them, and all white, all male jury. Then it was tried in Decatur, Alabama, not Scottsboro. And the jury returned a verdict and sentenced them, both of them to death, even though one of the women who were, there were two women who accused them of rape. And one of the women recanted and said, no, we lied. And e even in the face of that, and some other evidence that indicated clearly they had not raped the other woman, Ruby Bates. Uh, the jury convicted him and sentenced him to death and Judge Horton wrote an opinion setting it aside. He was coming up for election within a year. He had been overwhelmingly elected in the previous election four or five, six years before, he was overwhelmingly defeated in the next election in Decatur. And, you know, he's a good example. But there are a lot of, there are judges in Tennessee. Jim Martin, who's a trial judge down in Franklin, he, I can't imagine that he would ever let any injustice occur. So there are a lot of courageous judges. Then in the civil rights era, uh, Judge Johnson? Judge Johnson was great. Uh, John Minor Wisdom. You know, a lot of those judges took gas. They took a lot of guff from people. Uh, I think most of them tried to be conciliatory and work it out so there wouldn't be a big uprising. But you know, sometimes you just, people are gonna disagree. And Tim Yunick is one of those cases. I don't have any I have no regrets whatsoever about that. I mean, I mean, I, I would uh, be dishonest uh, if I did, didn't do what I think was the right thing to do after considering everything you can think of, you know? So you also have uh, an interest in the contribution that the U.S. has made uh, to the systems of justice in in other countries. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, when the Iron Curtain fell, I was chief judge of the, our circuit and, and a member of the Judicial Conference. And I was a asked, kind of an uh, unusual thing, to go to Moscow and do a program along with some journalists, maybe one or, no, I guess just journalists, and in connection with that, the Iron Curtain had fell. Yeltsin was the head of the government, and, and they were putting into effect a constitutional court in Russia. And I, several of them had been named by Yeltsin, but not all. And they hadn't really started an operation. And there was a guy named Zorkin, who was the, been named the president of the court, and I talked to him at some length and he said to me, and then I talked to one or two others, 
So you, we really need some help. We don't know anything about being a constitutional court. Russia has only had telephone justice. The, the, the Communist Party chiefs call the judges and tell them what they want them to do. And uh, so I called Rehnquist uh, on the phone from Moscow and said, this is what these people want to do. And I think it's probably we ought to try to set up something where we can give them some help. And we did. And he. Um, asked me to be in charge of the, this International Judicial Relations Committee, which was set up for a year just to see whether it could do any good. And then it was made a permanent thing. And we had a lot of uh, sessions, seminars, and judges were coming mainly then from the Iron Curtain countries. Um, and so I probably helped some, although if you don't have some history of constitutional interpretation, it's very difficult to create. And they've, Russia has found it almost, now they're trying to redo it and do it all over again. And, and, and the Constitutional Court didn't work. They got fired and so on. Now they're trying it all over again. Uh, and some of the countries have made real progress. I mean, Czechoslovakia, others. And of course, in Western Europe, I mean, Germany's probably got a better court system than we do. It is terrific. They've got a constitutional court, uh, and, and so. But the beginnings of it were the admiration. Well, the beginnings of it was the admiration that other countries thought they had in our system of judicial review uh, under the Constitution and the way the Supreme Court operated, and the federal courts operated, but particularly the Supreme Court. So that was what was being imitated. Now, that has fallen to some extent by the wayside. We are no longer admired in that way by countries around the world. Because? Well, because uh, other constitutional courts uh, seem to be. Really, in this country, we, we are in agreement about liberty in our legal system, for the most part. We want to maximize liberty. We want to have the most extensive liberty compatible with an equal liberty for others. Equality is a different problem. We're not of one mind about equality. We we pretty much one mind about racial equality, although there's still a lot of racism, and more or less of some mind about gender equality, but still got a glass ceiling, so on. In terms of any form of economic equality, there is no move here, uh, even though the Constitution and the Declaration of Human uh, of Independence says what it says. So uh, they don't admire our lack of interest in equality. So we're going to take a break here uh, and come back to, for some final questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good.